I am Zor. Welcome to the News or Education. Uh, today's topic will be quadratic functions. Quadratic functions. Um, the lecture has notes which are on the unizor.com website, so you can read the notes first or after my lecture, whatever. Um, I would like to present quadratic functions um, not as just, okay, this is a piece of information which you have to remember. I would like to uh, increase the complexity of the explanation about whatever quadratic functions are gradually from a simple case uh, to a more complex case. So we will all be like thinking about what exactly the quadratic function is and what's its properties, etc., etc., and we will derive this information rather than I just give it to you. So. Let's start with the simplest quadratic function. The simplest quadratic function is this. y is equal to x squared. Now, it's basically uh, a particular case of the most general quadratic function, which I can write like this. So this is the most general one, but we're not considering it right now. We are considering this function with p equals to 1 and q and r equal to 0. So this is for later. Right now, we're concentrating on the most simple one. Now, when we are talking about functions, we have to talk about, first of all, where it is defined, what's the domain, where it takes the value from, Codomain and what's its range? All right. Uh, quadratic functions, as we will be uh, discussing in this and some future maybe lectures, um, are always defined on a set of real numbers. Yes, quadratic function can be in theory considered for complex argument. Remember, the complexity is something like a plus bi, where i squared is equal to minus 1. We are not considering complex numbers as arguments to quadratic functions. Um, when we will be talking about quadratic equations, we will definitely consider uh, complex uh, solutions. But right now, when we are talking about quadratic functions, it's only functions defined on the real argument. So x is any real number. Now, why is it any real number? Because any real number can be multiplied by itself, which is square. Um, and as a result, you will get, again, the real number, which means the domain for this function is all real numbers. Codomain is also real numbers. But now my question is, the range of this function, the values which it, take, it, it takes, does it cover an entire set of real numbers? Well, the answer is no. Because positive and negative numbers squared would result in the positive number. So minus 2 squared is 4, and 2 squared is 4. You cannot get negative number by multiplying any real number by itself. So domain is all real numbers. Codomain, well, you can say that it's all real numbers, but the range where the function really takes values is only non-negative uh, real numbers. Zero, by the way, is a, a real value. If you put zero here, you will get zero as a result. So zero and all positive, which means non-negative real numbers are the range. OK, we've done that. Now, um, how about the correspondence between the domain where the function is defined, the arguments, and the range where the function takes values. In some cases, like for instance, in case of a linear function, we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between domain and the range. Because for every uh, real number of a function, there is always the real number of the argument, which if substituted into this function gives the result. Um, it's not the case with y equals to x squared. Why? Because 
um, you cannot talk about one-to-one -one correspondence if two will result in the value of function four and minus two also will result in the uh, in the number four. And any other pair of positive and negative numbers with the same absolute value will will actually result in a similar situation. So it's not one-to-one -one correspondence between all uh, the values from the domain and all the values from uh, the range of the function. However, however, we can always restrict our function to a narrower domain. So what if I will consider this function y is equal to x squared only on the domain of non-negative numbers? Well, in this case, we do have a one-to-one -one correspondence because for every So let's say it's a different function. I will use q is equal to p squared. p is an argument, q is a function. But I will consider this function only on this domain. Now, if I have any p, I will, I will obviously get some value of q. But if I will get any q, then I can always have a square root of q, the arithmetic value of square root of, uh, of q, the, the positive or, or equal to zero, the arithmetic value. Uh, and that will be an argument, the square of which, substituted into this function, will give the q. And if you remember, I always, uh, I'm always capable to, to take the square root of a uh, positive or, or, or equal to zero number, because actually that's how real numbers were introduced. If you remember the lectures where uh, I was explaining what are the real numbers, I was talking about certain uh, shortcomings of rational numbers. Like, for instance, you cannot find a rational number, the square of which equal to two. There is no rational, ration, rational number like that. So, we have introduced real numbers to expand our universe of rational, rational numbers to be able to find such a value p, the real number p, the square of which is equal to 2. So that's why I can always say that in the domain of non-negative real numbers, this function does establish uh, a one-to-one -one correspondence between all the domain um, elements and the range elements, because the domain will be non-negative and the range will be non-negative. And for every domain, I can always, for, for every element of the domain, I can find one and only one element of the function, and obviously for any value of the function, I can find one and only one element of the domain, and that's what establishes this one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay. Let's forget about this one-to-one -one correspondence and let's go back to our real numbers as uh, the full scale, all the real numbers, as arguments to this function, as it is usually done, basically. So, what I can say about this function, that this function is even. Now, if you remember, what is even function? Function is called even if For any x, if for any x from the domain, for any argument, um, I can say that the value of the function at certain value of the argument is the same as the value of this function for the value of the argument being negative to this one. If the values are the same, then the function is called even. Now, is this function even? Well, obviously, yes, because we have already stated that positive number being squared and the corresponding negative number with the same absolute value with a different sign being squared actually results in the same thing. So x squared is equal to minus x squared. Interesting detail. I mean, I was just explaining this, but can we prove it? Well, that's 
maybe a little bit less trivial, but let's just think about what is minus x? Minus x can always be represented as minus 1. multiplied by x, right? I mean, that's from the definition of multiplication, negative numbers, etc., etc. Now, being squared, <coughs> it's minus 1 time, times minus 1 times minus. That's what it is. Square means you multiply it by itself. Now, I'm sorry. All right. Now, okay. Hope they finish. Multiplication is. Multiplication is commutative, which means Okay, this is Well, we have a construction running. Anyway. Now, if you will multiply uh, sequentially, minus 1 times minus 1 gives you 1, times x times x, x times x squared is x squared, so this, one, this is equal to x squared. So this is actually a proof. I'm using the definition of what is minus x, and I'm using the commutative property of multiplication. So I'm basically, I've proved that this function is even, because x squared is the same as minus x squared. Yeah, this is a trivial proof, but look, uh, everything should be logically uh, solid. So if you are stating something, you have to be prepared to, to prove your point. So I proved my point. This is an even function. Now, since this function is even, then its graph is symmetrical relative to the y-axis. Now, I will start um, uh, working with the uh, graph right now. I will explain how the graph should go. But whatever um, I will use as, as my logic to draw the graph for the uh, positive x, no negative, rather, x, then I will use the symmetry and reflect it relatively to the y-axis to get the other part of the graph. So I will draw the graph of this function only for non-negative x. And then by symmetry, I will extend it to the negative part. All right, so let's talk about how this particular graph looks like. Well, first of all, First of all, we can start from the point where argument is equal to 0, and the function obviously is equal to 0 as well. So the graph starts here, and then we extend it to the right, increasing the argument, and then I will reflect it by symmetry relative to the y-axis. All right, so first of all, what we can say is that the graph should go upwards, because for every greater value of x, the value of y is also greater. Uh, if the number is multiplied by itself, which is x squared, the greater the number we take, the greater the result will be. So, uh, I would like to stop <clears throat> at point one, where the function is obviously also equal to one. So we have two points. We have point zero, zero, and we have point one, one. These two points definitely belong to the graph. Just out of curiosity, consider this function. Now, you know this is the straight line, and it also intersects. It, it also crosses these two 
uh, these two points, 0, 0, and 1, 1. Now, how does this graph look relative to this one? Let's think about it. Um, if you uh, multiply the value which is less than 1 by itself, which is also less than 1, you will make it smaller, right? For instance, 1 half times 1 half is equal to 1 fourth. So the result is smaller than the argument. So, if I am between 0 and 1 with my argument, the value of my function would be smaller than the argument. So, in this function, the value of the function is equal to the value of the argument. This is the argument, and this is the function. Now, this is smaller, so the graph should be below this. So, no matter where I am in this interval from 0 to 1, the value of my function would be smaller than the argument. So the function will go under this particular line, y is equal to x. However, at this point, it intersects it, because the value of the function is exactly the same. So I'm assuming, basically, that the function will probably go something like this. Now, after x equals to 1, if you increase the argument, so you're multiplying um, the number which is greater than 1 by itself, which is greater than 1, which is increasing. So the function will be, the value of the function will be greater than the value of the argument. If the value of the argument is 1.5, for instance, square, it would be what? 2.25, right? So I'm increasing the value of the function is greater than the value of the argument. So it will be, so the graph will be above this, uh, this line. So it will be something like this. So I am assuming from purely qualitative properties that the graph will probably look like this. Now, let me put a little bit more uh, uh, logic into this particular shape. The next uh, consideration is the steepness of this graph. Now, what is a steepness of the graph? Well, I can measure the steepness the following way. I take two points, uh, let's say x1 and x2. And then I take the value of the function, which is y1 and y2. And I measure this particular angle. So how much function has increased, which is y2 minus y1, relative to how much argument has increased? What I'm saying is that the steepness of the function can be measured by this ratio, how much function has increased versus how much argument has increased. Now, if function is uh, linear, y is equal to x, we know that the function and argument are exactly the same, right? Which means that this particular ratio for this function will always be 1. Because y2 is equal to x2 and y1 is equal to x1, so their ratio is equal to 1. So the function, which is a straight line, y is equal to x, <coughs> has a steepness of 1 always. Now, how about this function? Well, that's not the same, obviously. If you will take y2 minus y1, which is x2 squared, minus x1 squared divided by x2 minus x1. As we know, this is equal to x1 plus x2. For those who don't believe it, can multiply this by this, and you will get this. So this is actually not a constant, like in this particular case. It's a variable which depends of x1 and x2. 
Now, what I'm also trying to <coughs> um, establish is a local steepness. Now, local steepness means when x1 and x2 are very close to each other. So in this case, when these two values are close to each other, it's a good measure of the steepness in the, uh, at the point of argument x1. If x2 is very close to x1, then this particular thing would be very much a local characteristic of the curve. And now we see, okay, so this is approximately equal to 2x1 if x2 and x1 are very close to each other. Now, what I'm actually saying is that this thing is increasing with increase of the argument. So if x1 is shifting to the right, increasing basically, then this, the local steepness is actually increasing as well. It's equal to double x1, x2. So, the steepness must increase, which means that the, the, the curve goes steeper and steeper and steeper as we are increasing argument. That's very important, actually. Now, what I did right now is I have introduced basically the beginning of analysis where you have the derivative basically from the function. I'm not using the word derivative. I'm not using the limit theory, etc., etc. I'm just trying to explain it in more elementary, uh, from, from, from the more elementary standpoint. But basically, the steepness E is something which is, in this particular case, related to. Uh, okay, somebody's calling me. Okay. So. This is basically how the steepness can be measured. And uh, as we see, the steepness is increasing, which means the curve goes steeper and steeper to the right. Now, obviously, using the symmetry, because this function is even, I can say that the continuation of this would be symmetrical relative to the y-axis. So the complete graph of this function, x squared, looks like this. And it's called parabola. The word which we probably all know about, but this is the beginning where the parabola actually started. This is the function, the main function, and that's how parabola has started. All right, so now we are ready to um, to complicate uh, the concept of uh, function, and uh, we will gradually try to increase the uh, complexity of this function from the elementary uh, quadratic function to uh, basically, ultimately, to the general form. And that will be a subject of the next lecture. Thank you, and good luck.